Welcome back. Uh, I'm Ernie Bauer, uh, the Sumitro Chair uh, for Southeast Asian Studies here at CSIS. It's my honor to uh, present our second panel, which is a, a panel that will look at the role of maritime forces in the South China Sea. We've got a, a distinguished panel, and uh, I will introduce uh, each speaker in turn, and then we would welcome uh, your questions um, much along the lines as we did with the first panel. Our first speaker is Dr. Philip Saunders. He's the director for the Center of Chinese Military Affairs and Distinguished Research Fellow at the, National, um, at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Sanders. Thank you, and I'm gonna go in against type by not having PowerPoint, so it's a rare case of a U.S. Department of Defense person uh, speaking without PowerPoint. Uh, but conversely, I have to give you the warning that everything I say are my own views, not of NDU, the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, or anybody else. Um, to frame this topic, I want to start by posing what I see as China's regional challenge, that on the one hand, China wants a stable regional security environment and is trying to assure its neighbors that it is not going to be a disruptive force. And on the other hand, they want to defend their territorial claims and their aggressive steps to uh, pursue their maritime claims have generated fear and alarm throughout Asia. So I think that's the essential dilemma in managing that contradiction or the tension between those two goals is the biggest challenge that China faces. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the role of the Navy and the paramilitary forces in China's approach to maritime disputes. And I'll just start by noting that they rely primarily on the paramilitary forces, the new Chinese uh, China Coast Guard, and have been using a variety of salami tactics to expand China's effective control of the disputed territories while staying below the threshold of military confrontation. And I'll talk about the role of the Coast Guard and then the Navy in carrying out those activities. Um, and, and the key point is that paramilitary forces typically play the lead role in Chinese efforts to exercise control over disputed waters and maritime territories. It's partly because they're better suited for some of the types of missions, such as enforcing fishing regulations, and it's partly because Beijing thinks lightly armed paramilitary forces are less provocative, and that reduces the likelihood of a confrontation escalating into violence and military conflict. Uh, prior to March 2013, there were five different Chinese agencies, sometimes known as the Five Dragons, that had responsibility for maritime security. Uh, that's covered in my paper, so I won't go into the details uh, of it here. But I think the points were that Chinese analysts were critical of the capabilities. They noted that on the one hand, the paramilitary forces did not have enough ships, and those ships were not capable enough to carry out the mission. And on the other hand, when you had assets divided among five different maritime agencies with overlapping missions and bureaucratic rivalries, what you got was duplication of effort, you diffused limited resources too far, and you made your coordination problems much more difficult. So at least the organizational piece of it, China tried to solve by consolidating four of these agencies into a new China Coast Guard in March 2013. The paper goes into some details of that. It's still under the State Oceanic Administration, but I think a key point is that the Ministry of Public Security provides operational direction, and the leader is, uh, is seconded from the Ministry of Public Security to continue to run this agency, which suggests that they have a lot of influence over the operations of the Chinese Coast Guard. So that's one piece, is the reorganization and consolidation. The second is an effort to build capabilities, and I think the 2014 OSD report gives a good picture of this, and essentially the story is of a two-phased effort. One, 2004 to 2008, which saw the addition of about 20 additional ships. And then a second phase beginning in 2009, which saw an acceleration of that modernization. Uh, that's expected to add about 30 medium and large size ships, uh, decommission some older, less capable ships, and add about 100 new, smaller patrol craft to expand the fleet. So the net result will be a force that's about 25% larger through construction and the addition of larger ships, some of which are inherited from the PLA Navy. So that's in quantitative terms. In qualitative terms, what this means is the Coast Guard is getting newer and larger ships that can patrol further away from China's shores for longer times. Many of them are armed. Many of them support helicopter operations, which further improves their capabilities. 
And these force improvements, which now are the product of a decade-long effort, give the Coast Guard a lot more ability to sustain a robust presence in the South China Sea, including to the further reaches of the sea. Turning to the PLA Navy proper, I can't say everything about modernization, so I'm going to focus on the parts that are most relevant to the South China Sea. And I'll begin by noting that Taiwan is still the most important mission, but the task of defending China's maritime territorial claims has become increasingly important as a mission. If you look at the data, and again, this is in the paper, I won't uh, put the slides up, what you see is a relatively modest quantitative expansion in terms of major surface combatants. Uh, a few more destroyers, a few more frigates, a lot more corvettes. But I think the real important piece is the qualitative improvement, that you've seen a lot of older ships retire, their replacements are much, much more capable, uh, and, some of, and the result is a significant upgrade in the PLA Navy inventory. And some of the things that modern ships uh, feature are much more effective radar and communication systems, much better air defenses, the ability to carry more modern and more lethal anti-ship cruise missiles, and a greater operational range. And a lot of those capabilities are particularly relevant to the South China Sea, where forces have to operate outside the, ran the range of uh, land-based aviation. The other significant development is the deployment of China's first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, uh, originally built by Ukraine, never finished, and converted and finished uh, by China. It's a ski jump style carrier, so it doesn't have catapults, and that limits the payload that aircraft operating off it can, uh, can carry. It's not yet operational, although it's done its first training cruise, and aircraft are conducting training missions. Um, one of the points I want to make, I've talked a little bit about some of the new capabilities, but I think the point is how they're being used and China's willingness to show them off. Historically, China's been reluctant to showcase new capabilities, uh, and concerned about transparency. But I think there's a shift that increasing PLA strength means that China now has the ability to demonstrate its capabilities in order to shape its regional security environment. And there's a number of recent in instances where China has done this. In March 2013, a four-ship PLA Navy flotilla uh, went into the South China Sea, including a televised oath-taking ceremony by Marines and sailors uh, right off the James Shoal. Uh, so that was certainly significant, and it was significant, I think, that Xi Jinping uh, visited Sanya a couple weeks later to meet with some of the ships uh, and the crews involved in the deployment. The Liaoning's, uh, the aircraft carrier's initial training deployment was in November 2013. It sailed from Qingdao uh, into the South China Sea, uh, and even though not operationally capability, that capable that showcases uh, something that's a new capability for the Navy and the fact that it's potentially relevant to the South China Sea. And then I think the January 2014 Navy deployment of two destroyers and an amphibious landing craft, again, through the South China Sea, but out through the Sunda, Lampak, uh, and Makassar Straits, conducting anti-piracy search and rescue and live fire drills, again, showing the capability to patrol further away from China's coast. Uh, the last. Uh, Last point I want to touch on is the coordination between the Navy and the Coast Guard. As I've said, generally China prefers the Coast Guard to be in the lead. That has been the pattern in Scarborough, uh, Scarborough Shoal and the Senkaku Islands tensions with China Maritime Surveillance and Fisheries Law Enforcement Command ships directly asserting Chinese sovereignty in the Navy in a backup position, which is the way China prefers to operate. But we have seen more and more joint exercises between Coast Guard and Navy vessels beginning in July 2009. And there's also an increasing educational and training relationship between the, uh, the personnel in those two services. Uh, I think the most impressive example of this is the May 2014 deployment of the Sinook oil rig uh, to waters claimed by both China and Vietnam. And what's impressive there is that the rig was accompanied by some 80 ships, including seven PLA Navy warships. The size of that deployment suggests that China anticipated potential resistance and wanted to deter uh, attacks, or, but also be positioned to respond to them. And I think what's impressive there is showing that this was a carefully planned and coordinated operation, showing that China can coordinate Navy assets, Coast Guard assets, and state-owned enterprise assets. Uh, and that's a step forward for them. 
Um, the last point I want to make in conclusion is to note that, you know, clearly this investment in maritime capabilities, both for the Coast Guard and Navy, has improved Beijing's ability to enforce its maritime territorial claims in the South China Sea. And I think we've seen Chinese leaders that are more willing to use these capabilities in response to perceived challenges. But clearly this more assertive approach to territorial disputes is in tension with efforts to persuade neighbors that China is committed to peaceful development and regional stability. And maintaining this balance between those two goals, I think, is a challenge. There's a variety of things China tries to do, including relying primarily on paramilitary forces um, to pursue its claims, to try to deter challenges by other countries, uh, insisting on bilateral resolution in order to present, prevent uh, others from uniting to resist Chinese tactics, and a willingness, to, a stated willingness at least, to pursue joint development. And I think the Chinese hope is that these measures, coupled with its reassurance arm of its strategy, will allow China to gradually expand its effective controls without the need to use force. Ultimately, though, this is based on the belief that the regional balance of power is moving in China's favor and that other countries will eventually compromise. However, as everyone in this room knows, other claimants also face nationalist publics and are unlikely to simply abandon their claims. And if they adopt equally uncompromising policies, I think these more assertive Chinese efforts are going to have an increasingly corrosive impact on China's relations with its neighbors and on the regional security environment. So to manage these tensions as China hopes, it requires agile diplomacy and very effective control and coordination of both military and paramilitary forces. And unfortunately, China's nationalistic policy environment and mixed crisis management record doesn't inspire confidence in Beijing's ability to strike and maintain the right balance. Let me stop there. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, next, we'll turn to um, uh, Vietnam and, and other uh, topics. And that discussion will be led by Dr. Carl Thayer, who is the uh, emeritus professor uh, for hum in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales uh, at the Australian Defense Force Academy. Carl? Thank you, Ernie. I'd like to thank the CSIS for the invitation. This is the fourth time I've attended. No jet lag from Australia. Uh, my outline is to focus very narrowly on the three maritime forces, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Fisheries Surveillance Force, and then relate that to the oil rig crisis. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Vietnam has a venerable naval history. Uh, from the 17th century onwards, the emperor commissioned the uh, Doe Hoang Sa, the Hoang Sa Flotilla or Brigade, a separate one for the Spatleys, but this one went to the Paracel Islands, five-week deployments, five, eight ships, told to take uh, enough provisions for that period, and they salvaged wrecks that occurred. This is a ceremony that I attended on Lisa, an island two years ago. I was just back this year. Uh, that's the island closest to the oil rig, uh, where they, they keep alive the tradition of remembering those who have perished and also who protected Vietnamese sovereignty. Uh, now to get to the present, uh, the first two forces that I'm discussing are under the Ministry of National Defense. Um, uh, that's the uh, People's Navy, and it went through several periods of modernization, and uh, thanks to the Soviet Union, and, and, and to make that very brief, it's from 78 with the Treaty of Friendship up until economic reforms, basically, but by 1990, to look at the change in the order of, of battle here, uh, it's really a, a principal service combatant, the uh, frigates, corvettes, and territorial class uh, frigates, light frigates, and their missiles. Uh, that's, that's key. The overall number of ships has been basically the same in the IISS military balance. The Navy's been about 42,000, 40,000, with including 27 naval infantry throughout that period. So, but the, the major, major improvement uh, is the acquisition of the enhanced Kilo class submarines uh, that I've pointed out on that particular slide. Vietnam's modernization is heavily limited to its defense budget, um, and that's uh, just under 3% of GDP. Uh, it's risen to about 3.8 billion in, in the most recent year, um, and uh, that, will, that, that shows the limited resources about what I'm uh, going to be talking about. Uh, the gradual force modernization has been from its first light, for, uh, one uh, copy of this uh, BPS uh, missile boat uh, is overtaken by more advanced technological designs, but the Vietnamese co-produced it in Vietnam. The acquisition of fast attack craft, the two Gepard-guided missile stealth frigates, which are the modern end, very little, and uh, 
the more Nina class uh, corvettes. Under the Navy, they're in charge of coastal artillery and they have the very effective bastion system that can fire multiple uh, Yacht missiles uh, and pretty well cover their, their mobile and they can cover very much up and down the coast, Vietnam's 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones. Uh, they're in the process of getting either two to four Sigma class Corvettes from, from the Netherlands, the Diamond uh, Company, and further enhanced, the, they've already taken delivery of two kilos and they'll have four by 2017. The uh, Navy, uh, under the Defense Ministry, there's a national defense industry that is able to produce 400 ton uh, gunships. They're upgrading the old uh, light uh, frigates from the 1990 period producing these uh, co-producing uh, co corvettes and, and producing uh, crews and other missiles for the naval. Future acquisitions, two more uh, Gepard frigates with an anti-submarine warfare capability, uh, two to four Sigmas, as I've mentioned, and the other Kila submarines. If we turn to the Coast Guard, uh, the numbers vary, 50 to 60 vessels, but probably only 38 active, three, only three aircraft, the largest 2,000 tons so when they confront the Chinese, the Chinese are, are two to four times heavier in weight and much more modern, capable, and, and sophisticated. The Coast Guard is a law enforcement agency. Its newest vessel launched this year is 2,200 tons displacement. So that gives you an idea of what they're on about, but they're capable of building uh, that size ship. Uh, Coast Guard missions are perfectly law enforcement, but the very last line, it's to cooperate with the People's Army Navy uh, when necessary. And since they both come under the defense ministry, that coordination is there. But everything else is, all the modernization that I've talked about from about the 1980s to the present has been from riverine to coastal to e exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, defending uh, features on the Sp Spratly Islands and the offshore oil rigs that Vietnam has. The newest boy on the block is the Vietnam Fisheries Surveillance Force, uh, shown here. Again, its newest ship launched in, in, in June uh, this year. Uh, again, around the 2,000 ton uh, class, the other is much smaller. Now, if we go to May uh, this year with the oil rig crisis, I think the important thing is to say is Vietnam has adopted a, both a conciliatory diplomatic uh, point, but has kept its navy and harbor. And none of its armed Coast Guard vessels have unsheathed their weapons at all, in contrast to China, which is engaged in uh, intimidation by unsheathing their guns and pointing them at the Vietnamese itself. And so here we have the oil rig crisis, which has led to a series of ramming incidents. Now, according to China, 1,500 of their ships, uh, the, uh, the Vietnamese have conducted 1,500 rammings. They say there's 69 Vietnamese ships, that's inflated, but that's 21.7 rams per ship. And I visited the repair yards along with Jer Jerem Cohen. We didn't see many damaged Vietnamese craft there needing to be repaired. So I think that the Chinese figures are absolutely in incredulous. But it has led um, to a sinking and capsizing of one Vietnamese fishing boat with 10 crew on board too, which were trapped momentarily in the cabinet when it was overturned. And it's led to the smashing uh, and damaging of um, this uh, fishery surveillance craft. There have been over 30 vessels that the Vietnam has had at sea from both these uh, paramilitary forces uh, that have suffered uh, uh, severe damage. The modernization program, uh, the US is providing uh, since 2009 a Coast Guard trading program. And if you read today's intake, the Japanese diet is considering providing uh, overseas development assistance to provide loans to Vietnam so they can acquire more modern Coast Guard vessels and they're expecting delivery by early next year. The Vietnamese National Assembly has allocated roughly 756 US million to the Coast Guard and the Surveillance Force, and an additional uh, 473 million in soft loans to build new fishing boats uh, to, to make them reinforce steel uh, to confront the larger Chinese boats which already have, uh, have that capability. So that's my presentation uh, on, the, on the three services of Vietnam. Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, turn next to a discussion of, uh, of the Philippines and uh, other capabilities from uh, Mr. Christian Lemaire, who's defense and military, uh, I'm sorry, who is the uh, senior fellow uh, for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, or IISS, in London. Uh, thanks for joining us again, Christian. 
Thanks, Annie. Um, and thanks to CSIS for uh, another well-attended and um, very interesting conference. Um, I was going to speak briefly uh, about the Philippine Navy, briefly because there's not much of a Navy in the Philippines. Um, and this is largely because the Philippines has, quite understandably, been much more focused on internal security issues for several decades. Um, the uh, various uh, waves of violence that have occurred with the New People's Army, the challenges they found with the Abu Sayyaf group, with uh, MILF and MNLF, uh, and various other domestic instabilities as well, have led to a long-term focus uh, by the Philippine military, uh, both um, on the land, but also in particular on internal security issues. Um, meanwhile, the mutual defense treaty that the Philippines uh, has been party to with the US uh, has allowed it to essentially delegate out its external security to uh, its partner in the US uh, and has allowed it to give international disputes a relatively low priority. That is, until recent years when suddenly the Philippines is much more concerned about uh, certainly its maritime uh, periphery. The military um, broadly, but particularly the Navy, has been underfunded uh, and it's been really insufficient to maintain maritime security, domain awareness, and maritime governance more broadly. Uh, and this continues to be reflected in the balance of spending by services within the Philippine military. Uh, in 2014, for instance, the Army was budgeted to receive approximately 64% of expenditure on uh, the armed forces. The Navy was budgeted to receive just 17% of that spending. Um, so there still remains a very heavy focus in spending on the Army uh, and on land-based security generally. Uh, defense funding broadly has been a very low priority for many years for the government. Uh, current defense spending as a percentage of GDP is approximately 1%. Um, which is the same as Japan, but uh, Japan has other mm. constrictions on its defense spending. Uh, it's vacillated uh, within this broad 1% uh, area for, um, for decades, really. I mean, it, it did rise briefly to about 1.5% in 2002 uh, amid the intensification of Islamist insurgencies, um, but uh, since then it's really been around 09 or 1%. And I think it's instructive to compare the Philippine budget with uh, the Vietnamese budget that um, Carl was just talking about, Despite the Philippines having uh, an economy that is uh, far larger than Vietnam's, um, its defense budget is uh, about two-thirds the size of Vietnam's in US dollar terms. So uh, because of these factors, the lack of uh, broad defense spending and the lack of a focus on the Navy, the Philippine Navy is, um, without doubt, uh, with the exception of Brunei, the weakest of the South China Sea claimants' navies. Um, there are no effective anti-ship missile capabilities, there's certainly no subsurface capabilities, uh, there's very little ocean-going capability within the Philippine Navy uh, more broadly. Uh, and I think perhaps the most indicative aspect of this is the fact that a former U.S. Coast Guard cutter, which is about 45 years old at the time, uh, was renamed Gregorio del Pilar when it was uh, handed over to the Philippines and instantly became the Navy's flagship. Um, so the very fact that that was seen as uh, certainly the most iconic and perhaps the most capable vessel that the Philippines could muster at that point um, is a damning statement of its naval capabilities. Arguably, the paucity of military capability within the Philippines is actually uh, one reason why the country is pursuing an independent third-party arbitration case against uh, China. Uh, lacking the military and paramilitary capabilities to enforce its sovereignty claims effectively, it is therefore resorting to legal maneuvers and public relations uh, efforts instead, um, which is something that Vietnam has, has discussed and talked about, but has not felt the need to do so, perhaps in order to manage its relations with China uh, better. Um, that's not to say that the Navy is uh, irrelevant in Philippine calculations, uh, and the military more broadly does have a role to play in its South China Sea claims. Uh, the Philippines occupies 10 features in the South China Sea in the Spratly Islands, um, and uh, the military is often present there. The Sierra Madre, the grounded um, uh, vessel on Second Thomas Shoal, has become a crucible for competition between China and the Philippines um, over the past year. Uh, and is the most recent Philippine occupation of a feature uh, in the region um, from 1999. Uh, Gregorio del Pilar was in fact the lead vessel used in the 2012 Scarborough Shoal standoff demonstrating uh, the Philippine desire to utilize its new capabilities where possible, uh, but also the limitations of that given that the standoff eventually led to a fairly humiliating climb down. Um, but what we've seen uh, within the Philippines, as with other smaller Southeast Asian states over the last few years, has been a realization that military funding, defense expenditure is insufficient uh, and a resolve to uh, increase that expenditure in reaction to China's uh, increasingly dominant um, military posture within the region and increasingly assertive posture uh, within the region. So the 2013 budget, for instance, uh, in the Philippines uh, suggested a 25% increase in spending in dollar terms, uh, and we, uh, there are likely to be increased um, defense expenditure uh, figures for future years as well. 
Despite that, there are obviously uh, significant capability gaps in the Philippines military's capabilities given long-term underfunding. Um, recent defense budget reports uh, looked at four key areas that needed upgrading, um, air, naval, and ground defense and general headquarters capability, and set various targets for where the Philippine military should be uh, in coming years. So by 2027, for instance, Manila hopes to have control of the airspace over land and sea, and maritime patrol capabilities and include patrol and surveillance coverage up to 200 nautical miles of the exclusive economic zone. Now again, that's a very worthy ambition, but again, a damning statement that a country is currently unable to effectively govern its own maritime space and airspace above its maritime zones, and is looking at a more than decade timeline uh, to be able to realize that ambition. Um, the Navy is currently uh, engaged in a first phase of procurements to try and fill some of its capability gaps. Uh, and a contract has been awarded to an Indonesian firm, for instance, for strategic sea lift vessels. Uh, and it's looking very intently at other uh, possible purchases, such as um, uh, wildcat helicopters, uh, possibly frigates from South Korea. Uh, it's even discussed the possibility of purchasing submarines uh, as the regional frenzy for subsurface capabilities continues apace. Um, but whether the funds will be able to be found to um, procure these capabilities is another question. Um, it certainly needs anti-ship missiles, if it wants to be seen to be a uh, credible deterrent force in any way, uh, new frigates of some form, anti-submarine helicopters, multi-purpose uh, attack craft, uh, and um, amphibious assault vehicles. Um, but uh, again, this is a, a broad shopping list which a limited military budget may not be able to uh, fulfill. So, um, Given that fact, uh, and even with recent procurements and increases in defense budget, I think it's fair to say that the Philippines is going to remain uh, the weaker of the competitors in the South China Sea um, from a naval standpoint. And so the Philippines will continue to rely on US support, both fi financially through foreign military assistance uh, and in terms of the US presence. And that's part of the reason why we've seen a uh, rejuvenation of the Philippine-US military relationship in recent years, um, particularly with the Manila Declaration signed in 2011 and uh, earlier this year uh, with the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement uh, signed in April, which essentially um, will open up Philippine bases to greater rotation of US uh, forces in coming years, although it's not being clearly defined exactly what forces will be deployed where. Um, the difficulty of the Philippines, I think, in this strategy is that uh, a greater U.S. presence acts as a deterrent, but equally, the U.S. is quite rightly a little bit loath to engage itself in direct confrontation with China. So when it comes to situations like Scarborough Shoal, um, the Philippines can't really call on the U.S. to step in and send a carrier strike group to the South China Sea. Um, so the Philippines is still required to invest in its military, even while it's trying to rely on the U.S. for its external security. But aware of these limitations, it is also trying to build relations with other countries in the region, uh, particularly with Japan, which has pledged to uh, donate uh, vessels for its Coast Guard, uh, but equally with other countries such as Australia and India to enable to, it to internationalize its military relations to some extent. Um, ultimately, the lack of capabilities will remain a concern for the Philippine Navy uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, equally a concern is whether the Philippine military is ready and willing to use force uh, when required. The Philippines has not really been engaged in uh, an international conflict um, in its modern history, uh, and it's unclear exactly uh, how prepared its forces are to fight and how willing uh, the, um, the political leadership is to use its forces to fight. Um, so beyond the capabilities themselves, there are also questions about resolve uh, within the Philippine military. Um, it should be noted that the Philippine Coast Guard uh, is a very active force, uh, but again, it's relatively underfunded um, and relatively limited in its capabilities, particularly in the face of rapidly growing Chinese paramilitary capabilities uh, in the uh, form of the uh, recently conglomerated China Coast Guard that Philip was talking about. Um, so this is all a rather bleak um, overview of the Philippine uh, military, but it does suggest that while there will be more investment in Philippine capabilities in the future, uh, Manila will be forced to look towards other strategies, such as the legal route that it's currently taking, to try and uh, enforce its sovereignty and undermine Chinese claims to the region as well. Thank you, Christian. Um, and for the view from... Um Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, Mr. Shariman Lokman, who is the Senior Analyst of Foreign Policy and Security Studies Program at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, or ISIS, in Malaysia. Shariman. Thanks very much, Dr. And thanks for mentioning our full name. You know, I wouldn't want people to think that I'm from the other ISIS, you know. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, um, they, thankfully they let me in on Tuesday. Um, I'm just going to organize my presentation around uh, five key points. Um, I'll first describe the uh, sort of attitudes, perceptions, judgments that underpin Malaysia's approach uh, towards the situation in the South China Sea, and then I'm gradually move to um, you know towards uh, talking about uh, force moderniz modernization, force development in the Malaysian Armed Forces, uh, and I'll end with a brief note about the uh, Malaysian Coast Guards, the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency. Uh, my first key point is this: the, the Malaysian government continues to have. A, very high degree of confidence in its current approach to the South China Sea. Um, and that approach emphasizes the need for quiet diplomacy, the need to avoid discussions as much as possible in the media, avoid the glare of the media, and underscores the need to solve like, as much as possible to separate the issues into two aspects. One is issues of common concern, stuff that you know affects everyone, user states, claimant states, that you know, can, can, you can involve discussions about that, you know, uh, you can involve the United States, you can involve everyone in those sorts of discussions. The second aspect is the maritime, the, the territorial and jurisdictional uh, dispute itself, and th there is still this insistence that you know, we should keep that among the claimant states. I know it's very difficult sometimes to untangle these two aspects, but, you know, um, the working assumption is this. The working assumption is that, uh, uh, and it, an airing of the dispute in the media would unnecessarily incite nationalistic passions, uh, that it would further limit the uh, options for the, for the political leaderships of the countries concerned, uh, especially China, um, well, maybe including China, especially China. And the, um, the other assumption is that the involvement, the excessive involvement of extra-regional countries, including the United States, would, um, could be counterproductive that it would only provoke a very, you know, even harder response from, uh, from, from China. It's not that Malaysia does not want the United States to be present in the, in the Western Pacific and in Southeast Asia, it does. Uh, PM Najib has said that Malaysia welcomes the uh, U.S. rebalance, but uh, there is this notion that, you know, it needs to be, the role needs to be calibrated properly, you know, not too hard, not too soft, but just right, you know, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so in, in that case, me, sometimes Malaysia's approach is performing slightly, slightly different from, from Vietnam and the Philippines. And we get a lot of visitors to Malaysia, to ISIS, and they, you know, this, they want to talk about the South China Sea. And the discussion inevitably leads to that one single question that everyone wants to ask us. Why are you so quiet? Um, and and I, I guess it's two possible reasons. One is just sheer geography. We are just further away from the epicenter of, of the dispute in the South China Sea. Um, and the other is the nature of Malaysia's relationship with China. And that brings me to my second point. I'm going to move very quickly, uh, sorry. Um, Malaysia generally believes that it has a fundamentally different kind of relationship with China compared to the other Southeast Asian countries. The word special relationship has been used. Internal discussions in, 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 uh, in state, public statements, it is genuine. Um, you might be cynical about it and dismiss it as mere rhetoric, but uh, you know, and I was initially skeptical about it as well. But uh, I, th you know, it's not entirely unwarranted. Uh, the Chinese have been soft on us compared to the others. Um, they have been, I don't know, um, more forgiving of our oil and gas activities in the South China Sea, and that's very important for us, because forty percent of Malaysia's government revenue comes from the oil and gas industry. Uh, that's, that's our lifeline, um, you know, and there's this expectation that China will reciprocate our gestures in the, of the past, that it, it has a long memory, that in 74, Malaysia was the first ASEAN member state at the time, the five, among the five, the first ASEAN member state to recognize China in 74, that during difficult times, when, 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 when Tiananmen Square happened, the, the next month, you know, Tiananmen Square happened in June 89. In July, July 89, we sent a trade delegation when no one wanted to have anything to do with China at the time. Uh, our mission was the country that brought in China into the ASEAN framework in, by being the, uh, the guest of uh, the ASEAN chair in 1991. You know, um, we brought uh, Foreign Minister Chen, Chi Chen to the AMM. 
But this doesn't mean that we have any problems with China in the South China Sea. You know, you've heard mentions of James Shoal, you know, and you know, there, there, there have been all these uh, public, highly publicized visits. Um, you know, in March 26, 2013, four ships led by uh, its biggest uh, and, and, and newest uh, amphibious landing ship, uh, they dropped a sovereignty st steel in April of 2013. Um, and uh, Again, in, on January 26th this year, four ships that came by the, the, the amphibious landing ship, I can't pronounce the name, Jiang Ji Shan, I can't pronounce it. Um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, we initi I mean, the Navy initi nation Navy initially said they weren't there, but finally the uh, Chief of Defense Force came around and said they, are, they, they did pass through James Shoal on, on January 26th this year. Uh, it's just that there's this real desire not to make a big fuss about it. Uh, that, that, you know, discussions, again, back to the, the orig my original point, discussions should be kept firmly within the official channels and not to bring it up in, in the media too much. Um, and also, well, the, 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 other, the other incursions that we don't really hear about, uh, that's never been reported in the press, but it has been mentioned in Parliament recently, in, um, on, 22nd of, uh, on the 20th of March, 2014, uh, the Malaysian government told Parliament that, and I quote, uh, I'm um, translating this from the Malay, since 2000 and 2011, incursions by the warships of the People's Republic of China into Malaysian waters in the South China Sea have taken place at least once a year. Since 2013, there has been an increase in the number of incursions by the PRC that are focused in the areas of South Laconia Shoals, North Laconia Shoals, and also James Shoals. These are all within Malaysia's economic, exclusive economic zone. Minister added that since 2013, seven incursions have, have been detected involving 16 assets of the People's Liberation Army Navy and the Chinese Coast Guards. Um, the seven incursions and the uh, 16 assets, um, doesn't, the minister did not give any details about, you know, I don't think it's 16 ships on, on, on each occasion, yeah? So, yeah, um, but uh, you know, even even though there's, there have been all these incursions, uh, mission, the, you know, when I when I talk to naval commanders from uh, Royal Malaysian Navy, they say that it's the interactions with the, with the Chinese vessels in the South China Sea has been professional, quote unquote. Uh, that sometimes even cordial. Uh, that there is become almost ritualistic, where you know we say that. You are, in China, you are in Malaysian waters, and they will respond, you are in Chinese waters, and they inevitably part ways. Or even continue, continue mirroring each other, but that's it. That's the full extent of the interaction. Uh, no bumping into each other, not yet. Um, and, you know, but, and it's difficult to determine how Malaysia has reacted in terms of forced modernization, because there's a lot of things going on here. But, uh, there is a plan to build a naval base in Bintulu, which is 60 kilometers away from Chain Shoal. There is a desire to develop an amphibious capability for the Malaysian Armed Forces. It's unclear whether this amphibious capability will be parked under the Navy or the Army. Uh, the Army continues to be very dominant in the Armed Forces Council, so I think the Army is probably going to get it. Um, and the uh, MAF has been very keen to get uh, assistance from the U uh, US Marine Corps. Uh, it's, I, I should note that in the last two carrier exercises, that they had uh, between nation and uh, uh, US military, uh, they have both inf had amphibious landings uh, as a main feature of those exercises. My third key point, um, sorry, do I, do I have? Um, a little bit of time. Yeah, thanks. Third key point, it's not about, all about China, it's not all about, all about South China Sea. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that it's very tempting to say, well, it's all about China, that you're, you're spending more and more, and it's all about China. It's very neat, very parsimonious, very clear, makes, makes you feel very good, I think, uh, to, to just be very almost clear-minded about it. But in case of Malaysia, well, in the case of Southeast Asia, I think, we are also looking at each other. Uh, this is something that we don't really discuss. So Malaysia looks like Indonesia, Indonesia looks like Malaysia. When, when asked why Indonesia needs to have submarines, the Indonesian Defense Minister has said, we need to keep up with the other, other ASEAN member states. The Thai, uh, the Thai defense spokesman quoted by the Bangkok Post a couple, of month, uh, sorry, a couple of years ago said that we need to maintain the balance of power within ASEAN. It's 
increase. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's worth thinking about about that. You know, it's not it's not quite it's, it doesn't it's not often made very clear in the press reports that this is also a factor in forced modernization in Southeast Asia. And in Malaysia's case, the main thing that's driving recent purchases is not even Indonesia, not even Singapore, not not South China Sea. It is, um, it, those, those things are thought about, but the main thing is a response to what happened last year uh, in, in Sabah. Uh, there was, uh, you know, in, in February uh, 2013, there was uh, an incursion by 200 militants from, uh, this, uh, from southern Philippines uh, claiming to represent the Sulu Sultanate. Um, there was this, you know, that for three weeks, the government wanted to resolve that situation peacefully, but its, it's hand was forced when uh, you know, policemen were killed. Uh, in, in one case, uh, about four of them had their bodies mutilated. Uh, one man, uh, one policeman was beheaded. Um, you know, in, in the end, uh, the government just had to launch a all-out assault, uh, including bombings by uh, F-18s, uh, which was very effective. Um, in the end, you know, uh, nine, nine, nine members of the Malaysian security forces were killed, 68 militants killed. Um, but you know, after that event, there was a bit of soul searching going on. It's like, gosh, this, this shouldn't be happening to us. You know, this, is, this is just 200 ragtag sort of you know, militants. Yeah? Um, and, and there were two principal conclusions were reached by the Malaysian forces. One, there needs to be a renewed emphasis on counterinsurgency. Uh, might sound familiar to some people here. Uh, the CDF said that the fourth, Malaysian, fourth dimension Malaysian Armed Forces plan for the MAF, which is the main sort of like document that informs purchases, uh, focused primarily on con conventional threats and we did not place enough emphasis on combating symmetric threats. The other conclusion that was reached was that Malaysian Armed Forces they needed to bolster its capability to move reinforcements quickly from one, one side of Malaysia to the other. Um, they had a CPX a command post exercise earlier this year, and they, they found that there were, there were gaps in their capabilities. Uh, and so uh, a lot of money is being channeled towards uh, low-intensity conflict. Um, the Malaysian Army is getting the, uh, the biggest share of, of recent spending. Um, where the Navy is getting a lot of uh, small patrol boats. That's, that's the main uh, uh, preoccupation right now. Uh, and they also think about sea basing, you know, turning uh, amphibious ships, um, okay, turning amphibious ships into, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, turning uh, the auxiliary ships into a sea base sort of thing. Um, so the fourth and fifth point very quickly, the fourth point is the Malaysian Navy is, is pretty stretched. Uh, it's, it has a core force about 39 sh uh, surface ships uh, and two submarines. Uh, its development has been in fits and starts, really. Uh, there's, it's always been, oh, we're going to give you lots of money, then there's an economic crisis, then plans get, 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 um, get, get trimmed. Um, it, it is a very, very big uh, sea area that we're talking about. We're talking about an EEZ the size of California, basically. So 39 ships won't do it. Um, but you know, there, there is a plan to purchase six uh, littoral combat ships. We're calling it littoral combat ships, not the same as the, the US LTS. Six will be added into the inventory within a uh, couple of, uh, four or five years. And uh, that should fill in quite a bit of gap there. Last point, in talking to, uh, to people in the security establishment in, in Malaysia, there is a growing sense that uh, we need to focus more on building, the, building out the capabilities of the MMA, the Coast Guards, uh, that the Coast Guard is the best place to um, deal with, internet, uh, deal with uh, incursions from, uh, from China because they are sending their civil and maritime, maritime vessels. And, uh, 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 you know, they say don't bring, a, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, this is, the, this is uh, 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 opposite. You know, don't bring a cruise missile to, to essentially what is essentially usually a staring contest, you know. So uh, bring, you know, uh, so have, don't, don't have all these uh, ships that can, that, get, they, that are fully armed to, to, um, to, to the South China Sea. It's better to have lightly armed stuff. Uh, unfortunately, the, it is, the, the uh, MUA vessels are pretty old, uh, uh, so uh, you know, there is a real need to invest more on, on building new ships for the MUA 
Thanks very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, the panel, and uh, we'll open the floor to to questions. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the, the first one. But when you do ask your question, just please identify yourself and your institution. I, I wonder if um, the panel could comment on uh, the your country's attitudes towards Japan's um, uh, the proposition that Japan would play a more active role in regional uh, security and defense, and do you see that happening already with your countries, and, and what, um, what is their attitude towards an, an increased Japanese role? That's a bad thing. Okay, thought so. Well, Viet <clears throat> Vietnam has made it clear that it welcomes any country, including the United States or Japan, that contributes positively to regional peace and security. And in that respect, it welcomes what ja Japan is doing as long as it contributes positively. And that's viewed positively in Hanoi. Uh, I think the same is true in Manila as well. Despite a, a somewhat tricky history um, between Japan and the Philippines uh, after the Second World War, uh, Manila is keen to um, have any strong friends it can lean upon and uh, rely upon for uh, greater equipment capabilities and, uh, and capacity building as well. Could you, uh, Christian, could you just talk, is, is, are the Japanese playing a key role in uh, maritime surveillance uh, for the Philippines? I've understood that there's some role of uh, P3s uh, from Japan. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I think it's at a very nascent stage, though. Um, you know, I don't have uh, full uh, information on, on that, but I know uh, maritime domain awareness is one of the areas the, Philippine, uh, the Philippines is most eager to uh, improve upon, and they have discussed the issue with Japan. Um, what exactly that means in terms of uh, Japanese loan or operation of um, uh, equipment is, is currently a little bit unclear. Thank you. Um, generally welcoming, but I think cautious about any attempt to link the East China Sea with the South China Sea, uh, in, you know, uh, that, that discussions on those two things should be kept separate. Yeah. Okay, let's open the floor. Uh, the young lady here in the front. Mike should come to you soon. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm a geopolitical analyst. Can you talk, um, Dr. Saunders, could you talk about the future role of the U.S. carrier fleet given China's anti-ship technology? Um, it's, a, it, it's a problem, and it's not just a, a function of the anti-ship ballistic missile. It's, it's a multi-access threat in terms of conventional submarines, advanced cruise missiles, um, a, a, as well as the anti-ship ballistic missile. There's a lot of work going on in the Navy to think about the various ways to respond to that, um, with I think the anti-ship ballistic missile being the newest, um, newest kind of threat focused. Uh, but my, my center has just published a book on Chinese cruise missiles, which highlights the various ways which they can be used to threaten, um, threaten U.S. carriers. There are solutions to some of those uh, approaches, a lot of which involves trying to push forces further back out of range, um, and the Navy is, is pursuing a number of those. So I guess I would, I would add that, I'd, I'd come to the bottom line, that it is a tougher uh, threat environment for U.S. aircraft carriers to operate. There's a variety of things we can do to mitigate some of that. But the bottom line is there's going to be an increased risk when you go inside the threat envelope of certain weapon systems. And, you know, that's, I think, a factor for uh, Pacific Command and PAC fleet commanders to weigh how do you balance what you want to achieve with the operational risks you're prepared to run. Uh, Chris? Chris Young, National Defense University. I would wonder if the panelists could talk a little bit about whether <clears throat> they see the developments in the Asia Pacific as an arms race or an arms crawl. I mean, we hear a lot about how there's a relentless buildup of forces in the, the Asia Pacific. And I'm wondering if they're feeding off of each other or if is it a natural development force modernization capability developing in the Asia Pacific region. So there's a, there's a debate over which one is which. Um, the second thing I'd like to ask is uh, you you've all have focused a lot on the hardware Talk a little bit about the software with regard to capabilities, uh, training, ISR, command and control, that sort of thing. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, just on the arms race issue, this is a topic that I've um, discussed um, fairly frequently. Uh, now, I am more reticent to use the phrase arms race than uh, other people, just because I think there's so much historical baggage tied up with that particular phrase. Um, there is definitely a military procurement competition occurring within East Asia. There are definitely action-reaction dynamics to it. The Vietnamese submarines uh, could be seen as just an expansion to the subsurface realm uh, in a developing country, but buying six subs uh, when China has increasingly dominant uh, surface capabilities and other countries also buying subs um, does appear to be a clear reaction to China's uh, increasing dominance of the surface. Um, but there are other reactions in there. You know, why does Malaysia need two submarines? Perhaps it doesn't, but maybe it wants them because Singapore's got four submarines. Um, so there are inter-regional rivalries that are also um, fueling these, uh, these purchases as well. And as Sharon said, there are internal security issues as well to some extent. Um, so, yes, I think uh, we can certainly talk about military procurement competition. I would also say that uh, you know, it's, it's not much of an arms race when most defense expenditure um, as a percentage of GDP is not increasing very quickly. Japan has recently increased its defense budget for the first time in more than a decade, and last year by the most in more than two decades, but it's still about 1% of GDP, and it's a statement that will increase defense spending over the next five years by 5% is really not a race in any sense. Uh, it's not very rapid in any way. Um, so, you know, I think it's difficult to talk about a regional arms race. Um, I think it's very difficult to talk about an arms race when there's really only one horse in that race, and that is China. There's no real symmetry to the competition at the moment um, between China and its neighbors, uh, nor between the U.S. and China as well. I think there is the possibility in the very long term for an arms race between China and the U.S. if relations uh, deteriorate and there is a, a greater bilateral military competition. Um, but for the moment, I would refrain from using the phrase arms race and refer more to a military procurement competition between various states and within the region more broadly. Does anyone else want to comment on the race? Uh, Carl? Yeah, the historic baggage is that two, two countries identify each other as adversaries and strain and resources to compete, uh, each trying to match and countermatch the other. So by that definition, using the historical baggage, no, there's not an arms race in the region. He, he asked us about questions. ISR and software. Yeah. Um, sure, All right. Uh, in terms of training, um, as I mentioned, the amphibious capability, we're doing a lot of work with uh, U.S. Uh, Marines. Um, and the uh, amount of interactions that we're ha we having with the United States government on uh, the United States military is increasing re quite rapidly. Uh, uh, there were three ship visits, uh, sorry, six ship visits in 2003. Uh, by 2011, it was plus, 30 plus. Um, and in most instances when U.S. Navy visits, uh, we usually have a, one, an exercise, one exercise or another. Uh, we're doing quite a lot on, with the uh, U.S. Air Force as well. Uh, Cope Taufan recently quite remarkable. Uh, the, the first time the U.S. deployed an F-22 outside a U.S. base. Uh, it has been deployed in Japan, but it was in a U.S. base. It was deployed in Penang. Um, and uh, that shows the real sort of, uh, um, I guess, desire to in, in, uh, build uh, each other's, uh, well, not nation's uh, uh, air, air defense capability there. Um, so yeah, uh, we, that software part, America is doing a great uh, um, sort of service for us, I guess. So, um, yeah. Anyone else want to comment on software among the capabilities among the countries you're looking at? Yeah, I, I would just, uh, we, if we take the key, uh, enhanced kilos for Vietnam, uh, retired Australian uh, admiral uh, indicates there'll probably be Soviet technicians on there for, for several years, uh, at least ha you know, five or so. The problems with communication now, the, the, reading the Vietnamese army press, Quando uh, Nhan Zan, that newspaper, and that's you know, not classified, uh, there the are very few joint exercises where you have uh, the, the Sukhois operating with a naval craft. That were highly, it was a highly publicized one. You have individual mi missile firing exercises. But the intelligence was highlighted as an area for development uh, in, at the last party Congress in 2011. Vietnam's going to get its first uh, um, satellite, but it's not a military satellite. It's just a general one uh, that they can use. So it has to hook into to other facilities. Uh, so it's trying to develop its own SIGINT, uh, et cetera. But we're talking a very low base. 
And then there, I think there's a thing called the Lancaster equation that measures the extent to which the revolution in military affairs is actually integrated into the hardware. And I think if you did a bar graph and comparing Vietnam with other navies, you would barely see the green line of how much uh, RMA has been uh, brought into it. But as long as it's Soviet compatible equipment, and uh, India is an alternate source for training, particularly submariners, there are 500 training there. Vietnam is putting its eggs in two baskets, the Russian uh, and the Indian one. It used to do Ukraine, but they defaulted, and now it wouldn't be possible. Uh, Ewan Graham from RSIS. Um, I have two quick questions uh, for Dr. Saunders. In the first instance, anyone else on the panel who wants to have a go at them. Um, the first, um, amphibious capabilities in the PLA don't get that much attention, um, but significantly most of those assets uh, are deployed in the South China Sea. Uh, and they have been growing um, from a small base quite rapidly. There's also a large resolve of, uh, reserve of amphibious capable um, forces. So what, um, how, how much does that feature within the, South, the military strategy and the PLA sign for the South China Sea? And, and what are the sort of concepts that uh, might be developed going forward? The second point, the wording of the uh, US-Philippine Security Treaty does mention specific language about public vessels uh, in the case of the Philippines. Um, that might be interpreted, I suppose, either as uh, Navy vessels, strictly speaking, or even Coast Guard vessels. Is China aware of that wording? And if so, does that moderate its uh, um, likely tactics when it comes to collisions of the types that we've seen recently um, around the Paracels in the case of Vietnam? I think I'm just going to speak briefly to the amphibious part. That, that is an area where there is some uh, increased attention, including in the training. Um, my colleague, Dr. Chris Young, is an expert on amphibious operations, and, and I think if you talk to him during the break, you'll probably get uh, a better informed answer. But I think you know, more broadly, that is a capability the Navy's trying to develop, and it, is, it obviously has relevance for the South China Sea and, and other areas. So it is, a, is an area of focus, uh, and things are happening there. In terms of the U.S.-Philippine Security Treaty, I haven't had a chance to ask that precise question. I would say uh, it's a public document. The, the Chinese probably are very well aware of it. Uh, how much it restrains their activities, that's a difficult question. I think they try to keep things under a certain threshold, and they try to keep the U.S. out of these disputes, both uh, by engaging us diplomatically, but also by calibrating their actions in ways that try not to cross lines uh, that might, might bring the U.S. in. Uh, Carl and Christian. Yeah, I'd like to point out that the Philippines' U.S. treaty is ex worded exactly the same as the Australia-United States treaty. And I don't think it's really the question of military ships, it's the use of the word in the Pacific. And the U.S. has reportedly clarified that that does include the South China Sea. But the 1951 treaty, of course, uh, was signed before the Philippines laid claim to some of its possessions, so that leaves an ambiguity. But the wording is exactly the same, and as I told the Filipino naval gazers before the modernization, uh, an alliance is what you make of it, and in respect to the United States, what do you bring to the table? In other words, using the Australian example, you've got to, to pay some money and build up your own forces and make a commitment. Yeah, I would just, uh, I would agree with Philip. I think, um, you know, it's impossible to say whether the Chinese are um, fully aware of it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think that um, they are making a calculated gamble that the U.S. will not commit uh, significantly in a military fashion to uh, civilian or China Coast Guard vessels harassing through non-military coercion um, Philippine uh, vessels as well. And so... Um, the uh, long-term strategy of China, which is, seems to be one of relative dispute management, uh, whereby they are not trying to escalate these disputes to the level of conflict, but equally certainly not resolving them in any way, um, also involves uh, pushing uh, the status quo as much in their favor um, without drawing in a, a particular U.S. military reaction. And I think that gamble is part and parcel of what they're doing in the South China Sea uh, with the China Coast Guard, but also civilian vessels. Yes, um, I'm retired Vice Admiral Koda, the former Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese fleet. And I spent 40 years in Japanese Navy and watching Chinese Navy very carefully. And the 
two comments and two questions. One, there were questions about Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile and the arms racing. The, you know, according to the op open news sources, still the Chinese ASBM is a long way to go, especially you know, to complete that missile system as a whole functioning combat system. There are many things for China to do. So perhaps it's, oh, let's say, about 10 more years. But key question is, is 10 more, 10 more years is short or long? We should interpret that as a short, and we should be prepared for that. And arms race, if we, you know, the one analogy is if the US is the grown up adult in terms of naval capability, Chinese capability could be the senior of the high school or college graduate, or college student. And all the ASEAN nations, they are graders. Do you say this arms race? No. Okay. And the only Japan is competing, but our defense budget last 15 years has been you know, declining about 1 to 0.5% every year, except the last year. Okay. And Chinese total spending of the, this is also the released spending is about 80 US dollar, billion dollar equivalent. Japan is about 40 US billion dollar equivalent. So this is also not an arms race. And questions to the panelists. One is, you know, the Chinese strategy of the white ship against white ship. This looks brilliant. But at the same time, regional nations also know what to react or how to react. For example, Vietnamese in the last May response, you know, they also send the white ship. Or Japanese response to the Chinese challenge at Senkaku, we have been also sending the, the only the white ship. Our Navy is far over the horizon. So, you know, the, if regional nation still may, and they employ these tactics, perhaps all the incident would go for the stalemate. So we have to be prepared for the, the kind of the long lasting conflict or non combat skirmish. And my question to the Philip is, you know, the, the, what could be the Chinese alternate strategy against uh, of the white ship? Because if, or does China, or is China prepared to take the risk of the long, maybe decades long, you know, the, the conflict? Then that's my question. And second is not well discussed, but you know, the some the Malaysian Navy, for example of Vietnamese Navy, they have started operating submarines. And operating submarine is not easy. Safety or water space management. And also, the tr submarine forces could be a trump card against, for example, Chinese carriers. Okay. What could all the original Navy can do to operate submarine effectively and safely against the growing Chinese Navy's challenges. Th that's my second question. And the, the, the third one is the easy. Yeah, but all of the nations, in terms of the maritime domain awareness, they lack the naval aviation capability. So China also, China's Chinese Navy looks strong, but if we take count the number, head count of the number of the, the maritime patrol aircraft, only handful. Okay, Vietnamese, Filipino, almost nothing. So, uh, w what is the opinion, especially the Filipino and Vietnamese? What their course of action? Yeah, those are my questions. Okay, well, let me uh, take on the white hole uh, approach. I think for China, that's okay because that keeps the things at a low level. It limits the risk of escalation. Um, you know, are they prepared to wait decades for this? I think they feel time is on their side and that their strength is improving and eventually other, the, you know, their, their gamble or their, their view is that others will eventually come around to realize this and find a way to give up their claims. So as long as this is done at an acceptably low level of violence and doesn't destabilize the whole region, uh, I think they're okay with that strategy of, of keeping it out of white hole, and I think they can be patient. What they can't do is be seen as losing or not responding to what, um, what they feel are provocations. And I'll let others, I think, speak to the submarine question. 
Thank you. Uh, recently retired, very senior Vietnamese general said there are three scenarios that the best one is August 15th, China withdraws the rig and then they can get on with diplomacy. Two, that they continue this long lasting pressure and Vietnam miscalculates and responds with a provocation and China comes down heavy. Or thirdly, that China just ups the ante and seizes a piece of territory that's out there. So at the moment, it's, it's white on white, uh, Coast Guard, fishery surveillance. It's unequal. It's not a standoff. It's a war of attrition. China's expanded the zone from the rig. It's damaged many Vietnamese ships. It's now operating beyond 10 nautical miles, even 30, to harass Vietnamese fishing boats to continually put the pressure on Vietnam, and Vietnam is, is feeling that. Uh, yeah, I think there are three aircraft <laughs> that the Vietnamese have for maritime patrol. The larger vessels are getting helicopters. Uh, that's in under the Navy. I saw Murray's eyebrows raise. The, the Navy only has control of three CSAs, uh, 2,000 seaplanes, a, a Spanish manufacturer. They've identified that as a weakness. I suspect the, the, they're hoping for the U.S. to provide uh, intelligence and information, or even Japan and, and others. As for the regional submarines, I, I think, uh, using an expression, there's Buckley's uh, impossible hope uh, for the regional navies to even cooperate. The ASEAN Chiefs of Navy meeting, which I've dealt with at other conferences in great detail, is struggling to even, it's improving its act in, in getting exercises and things together. But even anything like that would be provocative. You'd have to bring in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, probably the, the only ones that might operate would be uh, India, Vietnam on an occasional exercise, Russia, Vietnam, because Russia is about to be given a facility in Kamran Bay uh, for its fleet as it comes back from Aden and to assist in the development. But in other words, you've identified weaknesses, absolutely. Yeah, uh, very briefly. Um, on the first issue of uh, you know, white ship versus white ship, I recently wrote a book on um, what I called coercive maritime diplomacy brackets available on Amazon, close brackets. Um, and um, you know, there I was trying to identify why it has become much more common, particularly in East Asia, for the use of uh, maritime diplomatic force, um, even coercive uh, manners um, being used for Coast Guards. Um, and I think you know, we can take positive signs from this to some extent, that uh, China is not willing to escalate this to, uh, currently not willing to escalate this to a uh, full-blown conf conflict. Um, and that may be because of how the international system is structured and greater norms against the use of violence than uh, have currently than have previously existed. You know, 100 years ago, I have little doubt that this kind of thing would have led to some kind of conflict already. Uh, even 20 or 30 years ago, China has already had naval clashes with Vietnam in 1974 and 1988, but it seems unwilling to bring its navy to the front line currently. Um, so, yes, it's a waiting game for China, but perhaps there are other issues here that we could look at to, to draw some sucker from the idea that uh, there are great, greater constraints on the use of force uh, on China now, um, which admittedly might diminish over time. Um, on regional submarine safety, um, it's definitely a concern, and two years ago at Shangri-La Dialogue, um, a Singaporean admiral suggested that Singapore could host a regional submarine safety and rescue center. Um, that hasn't really progressed, but you know, I think all countries are aware, are aware of it. Um, Vietnam is receiving training from uh, very experienced submarine operators in the Russians, uh, and uh, you know, arguably some of the best submarine operators in the world uh, from Russia. So um, uh, that is a positive sign that uh, safety is a concern. But having said that, you know, it's a very difficult vessel to operate. The UK and France have operated submarines uh, for nearly 100 years, but still they have nuclear submarines bumping into each other um, uh, in the depths. Um, on maritime patrol, you know, for the Philippines, it's just one of a long list of things they need. Uh, they don't really have much maritime patrol capabilities. MPAs and, and uh, various forms of um, ISR helicopters will be very useful for them, but um, it's just you know, somewhere down the middle of the queue of, of lots of things they need. Yeah, I'll just address the MPA question, I mean, about mar maritime uh, aviation. Um, the Air Force recognizes that they, 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 need, they need this capability. What, what, what you have right now is just four Beechcraft. Uh, when you have four, you're actually talking about two at any point of time, right? Because 50% civility rate at any one time. Uh, the Beechcraft has an, has an endurance of only about five hours, uh, which is nothing. Um, uh, and after uh, the... Um, search for MH370, um, there is a renewed emphasis on that. Uh, uh, Malaysia, for a long, long time, has been doing something quite uh, understated but important with Australia, uh, something called Operation Gateway, where they, the Australians essentially fly their P3s out of uh, Butworth, 
and they go on, on, on this uh, figure eight sort of uh, route you know, around uh, the Indian Ocean and around the South China Sea. Sometimes when they are in the South China Sea, they link up with the, uh, the, the P3s from uh, Japanese uh, forces and they exchange uh, information. So uh, the, both sides will have full coverage of both East China Sea and, you know, uh, that unfortunately has that number of, of patrols on the, and on, for that program has gone down uh, because the P3s, uh, the Australians have been putting their P3s in the Middle East. Um, but hopefully it will go back up numbers. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that is no substitute for having a, one's own uh, uh, capability. You want to check on the footnote, uh, I believe Malaysia has contracted a Singapore builder to, to, to produce a ship to, for submarine rescue, and Darman from the Netherlands is building one for Vietnam. I, I missed that part of your question, but I think that under the eyes and chiefs of Navy is a possibility because they all recognize it and it would fall under the search and rescue. So that's, that's a protocol that would not be seen as provocative to China. So I mis misheard your, your question. Okay, I just want to apologize. I want to apologize to the others who have questions. We, we do need to stay on time, and uh, since we had several answers to that question, We'll wrap up. I'd like to uh, remind you that we're headed into uh, a short lunch and then a, a discussion of the legal issues uh, in the South China Sea over uh, lunch. And then this afternoon, just after lunch, our last panel of the day, we'll be uh, role-playing a simulation of a U.S. Uh, response to a crisis in the South China Sea with different actors playing uh, National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense and National Intelligence Director. That should be fun. Uh, but please join me in thanking uh, this panel for their expert advice.